Hi everyone, my name is Mr Turner, I'm Head of Science at Beadhaven and we've put this video together because we aren't able to come and see you from transition and you can't come and see us. Miss Hughes is going to take you through the differences between your learning space and our learning spaces in science and how science lessons work. She's also got a bit on experiments that you can do in the home, so we really hope you enjoy it and uh, look forward to seeing you in September. Hello Year 6, welcome to your transition video. I'm going to use a photo in a moment to show you how our classroom may be different to the classroom that you're used to working in at your primary school. So I'm going to ask you to have a little look around, see what you can see that might be different to the classroom you're used to working in. So I'm to compare your learning spaces and we're going to run through how they're different now. So one of the first things people notice are the taps. These are quite obviously for running water but they won't be what you usually have in your classroom. Another thing that you may have picked up on are these, slightly smaller but they're also taps. They don't have water running out of them, they actually have gas running out of them. So you may have heard from older pupils, brothers and sisters, um, that we do experiments using fire, which yes sometimes we do and it can be quite exciting. Uh, in order to use the gas taps, we attach something called a Bunsen burner, and I'm just going to show you that now. Okay, here we go. Here's one of our Bunsen burners. This is the tube that we attach to the gas tap, and this is the Bunsen burner that we use. You'll get a flame coming out of this section, so unsurprisingly, this region will be quite hot. But down here, it's completely cool, and you're able to change how much oxygen is getting in, and therefore how small or large your flame is, or how hot or cold your flame is. In order to do that, we attach the Bunsen burner tube here. This will go onto a heat proof mat and you'll be able to turn the gas on and light. Some of you may also have picked up on the fact that we use different chairs in a science classroom. So these are our stools. They're really convenient when you're doing practical work because once they're tucked away, you're not going to be impeded by the back of a chair catching yourself on it or knocking any of your equipment on it. So it can be really handy to have these while working in a practical environment. And people that were looking really closely may have picked up on these. These are our power units and they're used during practicals for electricity. There's lots of different equipment that we use during practicals at Budhaven, but you'll learn them as you go along. For the next part of the video, I'm going to ask you to join me in my kitchen. Uh, it's the sort of thing a transition student wouldn't usually see, but in these different times, I'm going to hopefully show you some interesting practicals that might enthuse you to start a bit of practical work at home. Hi Year 6 and welcome to my kitchen, where we're going to look at doing a couple of science experiments. Uh, one that I'm going to show you, you can replicate yourself at home, and then one that you might like to do alongside this video. Uh, so before we get started, we need to look at a few things you need to learn as you go along, uh, which we use in all science experiments. Here at Budhaven, we love to make learning interactive for you guys. So when possible, we like to fit in demonstrations to help you understand ideas and experiments to help us answer questions. Of course, there's a lot of theory to go with it, so don't expect practicals every lesson. The reason experiments are carried out is to test a question and find an answer. So in the picture I've used, the question might be, which solution releases the most gas? That is a question with a testable answer. We can mix solutions, collect gas and measure the gas volume produced. Here is a breakdown of how to plan and carry out a science experiment. So first we need to set ourselves a hypothesis, which is sort of like a question that we want to answer through the experiment. The next one is we need to identify variables, so I'll go into that in a minute. The third one is to carry out an experiment and collect data in a table. And the final one is to use your data to answer a question. Usually this is done by writing a conclusion. The practical I'm about to demonstrate is based on the pH scale. This looks at how acidic or alkali a substance is. I won't expand on that too much as it's not a totally straightforward idea. All you need to know is that we use chemicals known as indicators to identify if something is acid or alkaline. It does this by changing the colour of the substance. So I'm going to carry out this experiment to answer the question, what colours are acids and alkalis when using a cabbage indicator? We have three types of variable, the independent variable, the dependent variable and the control variable. 
The independent variable is the one thing you choose to change. So mine will be the substance I test. The dependent variable is the one I measure or record because it's changed as a result of my independent variable. Mine will be the colour change. The final one is the control variable. This is what we must keep the same so that we get reliable results. Mine is using the same type of indicator. So the practical that we're going to do is using red cabbage as an indicator and testing different substances around your house to test whether they're acid or an alkali. So I would recommend that for this one you change into something just as I have, uh, something a little bit darker that's not going to get stained uh, because using red cabbage, as you can probably already see from my fingers, uh, gets stained really easily. Um, so before we get started, you need to make sure that you're working safely. So I've put my hair up. Uh, if we're in a lab setting, I'd also ask you to wear goggles so it protects your eyes from anything getting in it. Things like lemon might irritate. Cleaning products, some of them are really can be really harmful, so you need to be careful when you're selecting those. Maybe do that with an adult in your household, uh, so they can help you select something that's safe and isn't going to do you any damage. Um, the other uh, safety thing is, if you don't have a pestle and mortar like I do, um, you may want to make your indicator by boiling the cabbage um, on the hob with a small amount of water. Um, obviously. That's absolutely fine, you can make an indicator that way, but you will need to do that with the supervision of an adult in your household. So to make the indicator, you need some red cabbage. I picked some up on my way back from school. So a uh, small handful is absolutely plenty. The smaller you chop it down, the easier it's going to be. If you don't have a pestle and mortar, I've suggested you could maybe use a, um, a rolling pin, a wooden rolling pin and a bowl, and sort of really gently crush it up so as not to damage the bowl. Um, something that makes it a little bit easier is if you use some sand, so I've just, fortunately we've been doing some building at the house, so I've got some sand from outside. If you live in and around the viewed area, it's really easy to pick up just a pinch of sand, um, but probably fine to use a bit of a little bit of salt as well, because it's coarse and it won't interact with anything in your reaction. Okay, so you can also add a small amount of water in just to get it going. So. So once you're happy that you've got enough of this solution, you're going to strain it off. I'm undoubtedly going to make a massive mess here, but I've just got a glass and a sieve. So I've just got enough indicator in my glass and plenty on the table so that I can now use some of this to test what colour change I'm going to get when I test things like my lemon, my orange and my soapy products. Okay, so the next part of this is using our indicator to test the colour change for uh, different products. So what I'd like to recommend is using something like a white plate so it's really easy to see the colour change. You need something that's going to drop the indicator. So I've got a hugely scientific cowpole dispenser uh, and your indicator. So here are the products I'm going to test. I've got a lime, an orange, a lemon, some fairy liquid, some napa sand, and some uh, oven cleaner with no harsh chemicals. So, let's see how I get on. So here are the results from my experiment, and here are my conclusions. Now for the second experiment. Here is all the information you need to know. Okay guys, so now there's an opportunity for you to get involved. We're going to look at a ball drop experiment. So what you'll need for that is a tape measure. You'll also need a ball. You need a pen and paper for a table of results. And it'll also be really handy if you had another person involved that could help you assist with the ball drop. So, I'm going to talk through the variables with you in just a moment, but here is the table of results that I'd like you to draw up so that you can log your data as we go along. Okay guys, so we're going to show you what we do um, in our physics lessons to test for how high the ball is going to bounce each drop. Okay? So, I've got my assistant, Mr Hughes here, and he's going to tell me at each height 
oh sorry, after each drop, how high the ball bounces. So I'm going to give them a bit of warning, and this is at 90 centimetres. Three, two, one. 58 centimetres, that's the bottom of the ball. Yeah. So I'm just going to record that in my table now. I'm going to do three repeats for each height. Three, two, one. 59 centimetres. Okay, and last one. Three, two, one. 53 centimetres. We then tested the bounce height from when the ball was dropped to 80 centimetres, 70 centimetres and 60 centimetres. Here are our results. We will now calculate an average and plot that data onto a graph. By using an average, we're making our data more reliable because we're taking more tests, so there's less chance for an anomaly. Once you've collected all your data, here are the final things you need to do to complete your experiment. Hopefully that's given you a little taste of what we get up to in science and maybe enthused you to get started at home already. We're all really looking forward to welcoming you to our department. So from all of us here in science, stay safe and see you soon.